Hello, good day everyone. Um, thank you to the organisers of this conference for inviting me, Professor Elizabeth Cotier Cook, to talk to you all today. I'm going to be talking to you on building a progressive management pathway for seaweed biosecurity. Um, if anyone uh, wants to contact me, my email is there and I'm from the Scottish Association for Marine Science best based on the west coast of Scotland. So why on earth would we want to um, work on seaweed biosecurity? I mean, as everyone knows, the seaweed industry looks um, from the outside to be doing extremely well. It's grown pretty much exponentially um, over the last 40 to 50 years. So why now? Why, why is seaweed biosecurity so um, important? Well, there are some major biosecurity related challenges facing the seaweed industry. Um, many of you will have heard of the ice ice syndrome, which you may be able to see here. Um, it's where the, the thallus, um, particularly of the red carrageenophytes, the eucumatoids, that it, it sort of becomes, um, looks, looks almost like ice, it disintegrates and, and falls apart. So um, between this, the ice ice, and also between sort of epiphytes, these small filamentous seaweeds that grow on the surface of the thallus, um, between these two can cause um, a real deterioration in the quality and quantity of the crop produced. And um, just examples of the Philippines alone, we've seen you know 15 to 20 percent of the crop can be lost um, across the nation um, through outbreaks of pathogens. In some countries, um, entire crops can be lost. And this, of course, can have um, quite catastrophic socioeconomic impacts on the communities that, of course, are reliant on this seaweed production. So back in 2016, I led um, the development or led the writing of a policy brief, which was published by the United Nations University. And I worked together with numerous colleagues um, across the world um, from many different institutions. And this policy brief provided eight key recommendations, <clears throat> two of which were very much focused upon the sort of, sort of biosecurity related challenges. Um, the one being really to exercise the precautionary approach when introducing new or non-indigenous cultivars, because we do now know that transferring cultivars from one region to another or from one country to another can also introduce numerous pests and pathogens um, that are laying sort of dormant on or under the surface of the thallus. Um, also, we recommended in this policy brief the development and enhancing of biosecurity programs, both through capacity building and also incentivizing the development of diagnostics to rapidly detect pathogen outbreaks. So interestingly from those, and of course you can find um, this policy um, report online, and the address is just down there, but from we were able to secure £6.2 million worth of funding from the UK government, our UK Research and Innovation, through their Global Challenges Research Fund, to basically look into ways of safeguarding the future of the global seaweed industry. And it was, it's been an incredible programme. It's been running for four years, or three and a half years now. We, we finished in December this year. And um, we were able to bring together a number of institutes in the UK who have an extensive track record in seaweed disease tech, uh, seaweed, seaweed disease diagnostics, um, and also sort of biosecurity, um, particularly in other sort of shrimp and fin fish, other species, but other aquaculture species. So to bring those UK partners together and tie them in with partners in other parts of the world, um, including the Philippines, Malaysia and Tanzania. And these three countries were really our sort of key partners. So um, the University of the Philippines Visayas and CIFTEC in the Philippines, University of Malaya in Malaysia and the University of Dar es Salaam in Tanzania were, were sort of core partners. But the programme also, or the fund anyway, also 
um, £900,000, which we have also used to fund another 15 research projects, all sort of um, that are aligned with the Global Seaweed Star project of up to £50,000 each, plus another um, over 50 um, travel and capacity building grants. So we have really um, touched base or working with, collaborating with researchers from all over the world, all working in, um, mainly in developing countries, working on seaweed aquaculture production. So I'm hoping that through the fund and through the work that we are doing, we will leave quite a legacy when we um, complete this programme at the end of the year. So the four key areas that we were looking at, or we are looking at in Global Seaweed Star, include um, work packages which are related to seaweed quality and also others that are related to human activities. So the ones in seaweed quality, work packages one and three, it was really about detecting um, and identifying the key pathogens that are the sort of the yield limiting ones in the seaweed industry, particularly focused on the um, ecumatoids. So really looking at in-depth studies of the micro communi microbial communities on healthy and disease um, uh, uh, thallus and looking at characterizing those epi and endophytes. And there are um, a number of the team, members of the team that are busy writing up this work and it should be published later on this year. We're also very keen under the seaweed quality to look at um, the genetic diversity of the eucumatoids. Um, obviously, it's really important to find out what species are there in the wild and being cultured, what, what species are being introduced, where you can find new um, diversity, where, where other species, are, because you know the potential for um, having to breed new, more resilient species um, is always there on the horizon. And, and that's where it's really important to have a full understanding of the genetic diversity that you're working with. In terms of the human activities, obviously there's the one that is on biosecurity, which I'll be talking a little bit more about because it leads very nicely into the progressive management pathway. Um, and also another key, really important um, area that we've been focusing on is, is trying to um, understand the resilience, the socioeconomic resilience of seaweed farmers in our partner countries, um, what different approaches they take to risk management, what gender issues there are and whether there are any national or international policies that could contribute to economic growth and boost sort of resilience in our um, seaweed farming communities. So those are the four key areas that we've been studying. But as I say, I'm going to just focus in on work package two now for a while. Um, I should just say capacity building as well is really important. Um, to the program and this is something that we've been working at both at individual le levels. So we took on 12 early career researchers um, in our partner countries plus um, postdoc researchers. So individual capacity building is really important, but we also not just at the individual, but at the um, university or the institute level was really important, but as well as at the um, institutional level, at the national level. Um, and how we could help um, our different partner countries build capacity um, at all three, three of those levels was a real key, key component of this program. So turning to the biosecurity then, so what we have achieved over the last three years is that we have looked very closely and done a full systematic review of all the current biosecurity policies and legislation at international level, regional level and at country level. It's been some undertaking and, thank, and it's great to see that all of that work now has been published and the references are there. Um, really interesting, it's, it's found that the majority of that, um, those policies are not binding. So there are, there are not, um, there are no, um, there are no policies um, basically stating that something must be done and it can be enforced by law. So most of it is non-binding, it's just recommendations and guidelines. Um, the seaweed aquaculture industry in many cases is not specifically mentioned. You know, finfish, shrimp, yes, they're there, but not seaweed. And you know, seaweed is a major production uh, crop 
being, that is produced globally. And um, it's interesting that um, why why is that? Um, other other things that we noticed um, that were highlighted was that the majority of policies um, are based on stakeholder opinion, which is fine, but there was very little um, scientific evidence to back that up in many cases. So that's something that we have been working on during this project. And also there was a wide difference between countries, both on their policy and legislation. Some were far more advanced than, than others. But interestingly, if this is something that you, you would like to develop in your own countries, you see that there is a, a weakness there. We've collated all of our all of the different policies from all of the, the countries where we've we've collated this information and we've put it on an online policy database on our website. You can find it there. All the documents are there. You can have you can it's fully searchable so you can read through that and, and tease out some of the information that might be relevant for your um, your own industry. The other thing that we really wanted to do was as well as looking at the um, the policies and the regulatory frameworks that were already in place, um, we wanted to actually see how that re was reflected in the practice of what actually happened at the farm level, what was being done by the farmers. So um, we decided to use something called the KAP, Knowledge, Attitude and Practice Survey Tool. And this has been used in many different sectors before but not so much, only one other study in the aquaculture industry, which was for catfish in China. So it was interesting. So we took it and we adapted it for the seaweed biosecurity industry. And surveys were completed um, in the Philippines, the Malaysia and Tanzania and hundreds of seaweed farmers. It was really quite an extensive piece of work. And um, one of these in the Philippines, the, the survey has already, already been published. Um, and um, two other papers are in, in have been submitted now, so please do look out for those. Um, interestingly, it was found that the knowledge side of things was really highly varied, both within a country and between countries, so between regions and locations and between the countries themselves. And it was um, interesting to see how that related to um, the training that had been provided by the um, by the various sort of government departments. Um, interestingly, too, that the attitudes, though, were always generally good. Everyone was interested to know how they can prevent those outbreaks of pathogens. It was obviously clear because um, it reduced their income. So they they really were keen um, that um, that they knew to, to know more about, find out more about um, security and, and how they could implement it. The practices, though, really range from poor to fair. No really were in, in the good category. Um, it really depended on the country and some of the practices, obviously, that were being employed had been passed down, but were not necessarily um, really working all that well or that efficiently at preventing um, outbreaks of disease. So um, it was really interesting to use that survey. And again, it would be wonderful if in the future, having increased the knowledge of biosecurity and made the farmers more aware of the of, of various biosecurity practices that were more effective at reducing outbreaks, if we could repeat this survey um, and see how those scores change. So one of the um, well, each and every um, uh, one of our partners um, was or has been doing some various trials on different biosecurity practices. Um, one of the ones that is the most advanced is obviously from Malaysia and um, Cecilia Cambe, Dr. Cecilia Cambe will be presenting in more depth on this particular um, piece of work in her presentation at this conference. So I'm not going to go into it in too much detail, but just the key um, measures that were trialed and that were seen to be the most effective at reducing um, disease and pest outbreaks were these three here. First off, um, trying to use as clean um, ropes and equipment as possible, either purchasing new ropes, but obviously that's not practicable or practical or it could get quite expensive. But, you know, sun drying those ropes and equipment would also be sufficient in between each harvest. 
Um, using, of course, healthy seedlings for stocking purposes. If, if new stock needs to be brought in, just really making sure that there are no signs of disease or bleaching and, and trying to, to, um, to bring in, to source that stock from healthy, um, healthy farms that you know uh, are free from disease or from epiphytes, if at all possible. And then the third thing is just regular monitoring and cleaning um, removal of any um, epiphytes or any disease stock as soon as it's required and removing that to land, not, not leaving it in, into the water. So removing, so checking and cleaning um, on a regular um, basis. And if, if this is done, then, then the results were showing that up to a 71% reduction in eye size syndrome and pests could be achieved. So this is something that um, I think is, is really um, worthwhile to share with the farmers in, in your communities. So, um, so this actually leads on quite nicely to um, the, the topic of building a progressive management pathway for seaweed biosecurity. And it ties in and dovetails really nicely with um, an FAO um, initiative um, to develop the same, but for aquaculture. So this seaweed biosecurity um, pathway would sit within the main aquaculture biosecurity pathway that um, the FAO are developing that will be or hopefully will be adopted by your national government agency. And it's all about providing a stepwise approach to assist, assist countries to develop an effective and sustainable framework to reduce the spread and impact of commercially important pathogens. Aims being the obvious one to increase production and market profits to safeguard the farmers' livelihoods, boost food supplies and export earnings. Um, and also very much so to promote stakeholder engagement because there is no point in embarking on this if the stakeholders aren't fully on board with its development. And it also follows you know, very much um, a PMPAB toolkit that the FAO has devised. So, four stage approach. I'm just going to take you through each stage at a time. The stage one is very much um, a baseline, you know, identifying your key stakeholders involved in the national seaweed industry, the key threats, looking at starting to develop an enabling establishment, you know, an enabling environment through capacity building, produce a preliminary risk assessment and a practical emergency response, response plan and seaweed biosecurity strategy. So all just trying to put those building blocks in place, those first building blocks for stage one. Stage two is then actually taking action to implement and, bio, and monitor that biosecurity strategy that you've produced. Looking to see through the monitoring how it is improving, how, it, how it's lowering that incidence of pathogens continuing to build capacity, particularly in seaweed health and diagnostics, and implementing those biosecurity practices, maybe some of the ones that I've just mentioned. Revising then, going back, it's always an iterative process, revising the strategy and strengthening it as necessary, the one that was devised in stage one. Stage three then is all about enhancing your biosecurity and preparedness. So implementing those revised strategies um, building capacity, still building capacity and ensuring the measures that you set in your strategies have been achieved. Looking at um, monitoring those measures, providing evidence that they are being effective, getting the legislation and the policies just right to enforce that. Maybe those measures, if needed, um, rapidly detect and respond to outbreaks and encourage really strong stakeholder engagement. And then the fourth and final one is basically you're there. The biosecurity strategy is fully implemented. You've got great stakeholder commitment that is ongoing. You have those transparent and auditable biosecurity plans. And basically there is international and national confidence in your system. So ensuring um, sustainable production and safe trade with other countries. So that just takes you through those four stages. And these, as I say, are still just proposed and still under development. So 
Um, just to give you a case study then of, of sort of how, how it could relate to a particular country. And through this, um, this last three years, I would say that the Philippines now and there are other, well, the Philippines in particular and, and Malaysia as well, maybe Tanzania needs a little bit more um, work on this, but the, um, the Philippines is pretty much there with stage one, I would say, in the last three and a half years. So stakeholders have been identified and approached, obviously, through the survey work. Um, key threats have been identified and we're working through Work Package 1 to make sure that those key diagnostic tools are there um, and the, the, the main um, microbial communities and epiphytes and endophytes have been identified. Um, obviously, through our capacity building work that we've been doing, that enabling environment is now becoming established. And then other emergency response plans, seaweed biosecurity strategies are under development. Um, so, you know, and, and we've looked at governance, we've looked at the policies, we've looked at what legislation is there, we've looked at the economic um, situation, we've done that baseline assessment. And we're in the process of producing those training modules, which will be available by the end of the year. So all in all, I think the Philippines is in a really sort of good stage um, to be able to or state to be able to say that they've completed stage one and then they could then start to move to stage two. So, as I say, I think this just shows the clear demonstration of benefits of stakeholder engagement, dedicated stakeholder engagement and investment in capacity building. So we've also held, hosted um, a, a PMP for aquaculture biosecurity and seaweed biosecurity in the in the UK. Um, it was attended by representatives from the government, from the environmental agencies, from the organisation we call the Crown Estate here, which governs and, and um, uh, manages the seabed around the UK, from academia, from the seaweed industry and then other members of the Global Seaweed Star team. And we've asked them like a series of questions. And maybe this is something that you can also do and repeat in your own country. You know, asking what are the main challenges to implementing seaweed biosecurity measures and not just at the farm, but across the entire supply chain. So you can really factor in where are those critical control points where you would have to implement those biosecurity measures. How could they those challenges best be addressed? What are their uh, you know what are the key benefits they could see from the the PMP approach, and who interestingly would take ownership and provide a long term commitment to this? Some of the questions, obviously, in every workshop, there's more questions um, thrown up and produced than obviously answered, and it was really interesting just at this in the early stage of this development just to say, well, OK, biosecurity measures, great, but what's the minimum or maximum or what, what are appropriate for our farm? What are the appropriate for our size? So there's obviously quite a lot of work still to be done to tease that out. Another was like, well, you know, for shrimp, for fin fish, for other aquaculture, for agriculture, there is always like a, a list of notifiable pathogens. So if we're looking on our farm and we find something that's out of the ordinary, do we have to tell the government agencies about this or not? And it was really helpful, I think, for other industries to have this notifiable list of pathogens. Um, should it be driven by an international mandate or certification? This is something a lot of people said would be good, but is that the case? Do you think that would be the case for your country? Should it be industry or government led debates? So certain industries, they are they forge ahead and they are the ones that basically um, manage their own biosecurity. Um, others, maybe there needs to be more um, more um, proactive work by the government. Should there be regulatory framework? Should there be more policies? Should there be more legislation or should it just be left to guidelines and volu or voluntary guidelines to be followed? It's very different between different countries. Um, and what about movement restrictions? People were really quite concerned about um, about any restrictions being put on put in place um, for movement of crops between within country or between country. And again, 
Um, and then time scales. Are we talking about this having to be done in the next year or 10 years or 20 years? And there was definitely felt that there needed to be more discussion on some of these questions at both the international and at um, country level. And this is maybe some of the things that you could discuss within your own country and within your own industries. So just basically to leave you here with um, a, a take home message um, that I think to develop the, country, develop the seaweed industry sustainably, there really does need to be a focus on pathogen prevention and intervention you know, to, to minimise the chances. The risk of um, a pathogen outbreak on the farm is really important. Um, I hope that we've shown that investment in capacity building and collaboration with international experts can ensure a rapid um, competency within the country in biosecurity management and that the progressive management pathway could provide you with a clear framework for establishing and implementing a system to ultimately ensure sustainable growth of the sector and safe trade while maintaining the wider ecosystem health. So if you want to hear more or for more information on this or to help me with its development, please do contact me at this email address and I would love to hear from you. Um, any, any thoughts, any further information that you may have that could be fed into this process, that would be wonderful. Thank you. And again, thank you for your attention. Thank you for all of your support and all of your input over the years for everyone who's been involved. Um, I look forward to um, hopefully seeing you at the live question and answer session where, where I will be at on the 8th of July. Um, so hopefully I look forward to seeing you, some of you, at that, at that meeting. Okay, thank you very much.